Tommy. What a great guy. Yeah, good good people all the way around. Yeah, you were with some good ones. I was going to come down there and got tied up here. So. Good people, good people. Peter, are we live? All right, we're live. All right. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to Fire Engineers Hump Day Hangout to our show, The Issues and Challenges of Today's Fire Service. We've got another great show lined up for you today with another great guest. I love this guy. Um, he comes from a fire department that I I was just a bunch of times down there, but just recently with it, and, and they they get it, and they got some great people there, and obviously his legacy uh, is, is shining strong uh, through that organization. Um, uh, I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my good friend and Hump Day Hangout co-host, Louisville Assistant Chief Terry McGrath, who will be joining us shortly. He's in a class right now. Uh, that he's he's getting taken care of. Uh, we're missing a couple of our regulars, uh, J- Chief uh, John Salka and Chief Scott Thompson. Uh, John from New York City and uh, Scott from the county both have prior commitments. Uh, Chief Bobby Halton should be joining us. He'll probably be joining us from the airport. You know, the the Godfather is is usually traveling uh, and doing things. Uh, as always, just as a reminder, we remind you that if you have any questions for us, uh, shoot over to Twitter and send them our way. Uh, just make sure you add hashtag FE talk for fire engineering talk and our producer Pete will, will zip them over to us. We try to get to a lot of them. Uh, sometimes we don't, but but hang in there with us. But today our special guest is Chief Mike Wisco. Mike is the agency chief for the Texas Commission on Fire Protection. And we chose as our topic for today, and, and we kind of we ripped this off right from Mike's uh, and his team from their, their website, your path to becoming a certified fire protection pro- uh, professional. And then we added as well as everything the commission does for the fire service. And I was joking with Mike before we went live that there's no way in an hour we could cover everything the commission <laughs> does. Uh, if you go to their website, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, I, I've been here since 2000. Um, uh, we've worked very closely with the commission uh, it, it's a great organization. If you know my background from Illinois with the state fire marshal's office, I was heavily involved with that end of things there. Um, you know, when it comes to compliance, when it comes to just doing things right, when it comes to bringing people actually into the state that want to be firefighters, your state, uh, if it wasn't for this, this group and Mike's team, uh, you know, I think it'd be a big smoking crater. They do some pretty incredible things, but welcome chief Wisco. Thank you. I'm with the government. I'm here to help. <laughs> well, Mike, uh, let's do this. Uh, run us through your bio. I, you know, I know you, Terry knows you, but for our viewers, a little rundown on how you got into the fire service and kind of where you traveled and then how you ended up at the commission. Wow. Well, uh, I never knew there was anything other than the fire service. So uh, my dad was a, a fireman in Galveston, uh, ultimately became the chief for uh, right at 10 years before he left. Um, uh, my grandfather uh, was a firefighter in Galveston, actually made it all the way up to the rank of assistant chief, I believe. And I've got a couple of uncles who were uh, firefighters out in the uh, San Antonio area uh, at the airport, Air, Air Force, and then later on with some uh, neighboring cities around San Antonio. So I didn't know there was anything else you could do. Uh, I wavered a little bit. Uh, I got into the EMS side of things. It looked interesting and uh, ended up becoming a paramedic uh, pretty quick. 1988, I believe. So uh, anyway, I'm still a paramedic. I haven't started an IV since 2012, so I'm not the one you want around. <laughs> so uh, I uh, I did a little time over in the big city of Beaumont. I went to work over there in 86 uh, on the EMS. Uh, eventually got hired with the Galveston Fire Department in 1988. And when I retired in 2019, I had been fire chief for um, just over six years. And um, just decided it was time to do something different. I'd been in my hometown my whole life. And time to get out and see what the rest of the world was like. Well, so somehow a, I ended up here in Austin. That, that is it. That it well, first of all, Galveston, for those of our, our viewers, if you haven't been there, it's beautiful. Uh, big, big, big time vacation spot in the state of Texas for not just Texans, but for other folks that, that come. But um, what a great fire department. What a great group. I can't, I can't go any further without... Tommy Anderson, we, you you brought him up ahead yeah. of time. Um, yeah. You know, we John and I did a show on one of our other podcasts about paying it forward, um, helping other departments out. And, you know, we, we've got the Helping Hand program, some other great things here in this state that other people don't have, unfortunately. 
I just, I love that guy. He's got 50 years of the fire service. He just retired in the process. He's going to be, he's still going to be like on the board, but I mean, that whole area, I, I went to the pre, the Galveston County appreciation dinner for, yeah. for the fire. What a, what an incredible, I had a great night. That was, that was just a great group of people. Uh, good, good people down there all the way around the, the Tommy and, and the folks in Santa Fe, his son, Christopher, who's also a, a firefighter in Galveston, actually an engineer now in Galveston. Uh, and, and all those folks in Galveston County. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a small County uh, in geographic size uh, density. It, it's, it's pretty congested down there. Uh, it's the only reason Houston hasn't fallen into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's a good thing. And uh, uh, but Plenty of plenty of good folks. Tom, Tommy is certainly one of the rock stars down there, and he's practically my brother. Matter of fact, my dad is his godfather, so so we're, we're pretty close. And uh, Tommy would do anything in the world for anybody. Oh, so, I I love that man, and it was funny because they donated a pumper to our 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 volunteer fire department, Wichita West, up here, and uh, we went down to pick it up, Mike, and. You know, for I want to take his guys to breakfast. Me and you know Ryan Fetzer, our chief, are like we're going to take. You know, I mean, you know Ryan and Chris, our captain, they brought all the bling, the t-shirts and the patches yeah. and the hats and all that. <laughs> and then we go to breakfast, and 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 my butt didn't hit the chair, and he leans over, he goes, "You will not argue with me. You are not paying for breakfast." we I said, "No, no." He goes, "No." He already started arguing with me. He goes, "I told you not to argue with me. We're paying for." What a, we spent hours. It was just what a great visit. What a great man his love for the fire service. I wish more people had that. Uh, just, I, I just couldn't go any further. When you mentioned him, I'm like, you're like the 50th person recently. They thought that guy is great. You know? So that in itself <laughs> yeah. says something. So, and, and, and with you, it'll with take you, him a year to clean his office out there. If you went, if you went down there, you went in his office. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so let me, let me, let, let's, let's uh, kind of jump into uh, the commission here. Now I know, sure. I had the honor in Illinois. I taught for Illinois Fire Service Institute for a long time, um, Illinois Fire Chiefs, and then uh, had the honor of working with the State Fire Marshal's Office there, which does what you do for the most part, the, you know, the mm-hmm. personal standards and education, and uh, uh, was on a technical advisory board for all the certifications and so on and so forth, because I believe fiercely in doing things right. Um, you and I know, know each other, and you know my background, and all the years I do a line of duty at investigations and injuries and all that. Um, the 99 times I have a hundred comes back to someone screwed up, someone messed up, someone was complacent. Um, you know, somebody did do this, did train. And, and one of the stories I bring up in class, like Mike is, you know, I was at one place, there's a big lawsuit going on. It, it's a 17 year career firefighter. Doesn't matter career volunteer. You and I know that but fire one gets paid. One does not That's the only difference, but they're both professionals. But so this guy crawls into a one story, little shotgun house, Mike, with his partner do a search Ends up separated from his partner, lost and disoriented, runs out of air and dies. Doesn't burn to death, runs out of air. Never calls for help on his radio or nothing. So we get there, we're doing it. And they finally brought me his training records. Now, being a training chief and doing what I've done, you know, in all the classes, I was very meticulous about making sure we did everything right, right? So it t- I had to go back 11 years, chief, out of 17 to find any documentation this guy had done an SCBA drill. And the guys looked at me and they said, but chief, he knows it. I said, well, obviously he doesn't. He crawled in a one-story little shotgun house, got seven of his partner, and the lost in the store until he ran out of air and died. Didn't use his radio, didn't use the emergency you know, firefighter guidelines, nothing. And I said, I know he pumps for you and drives, but when he's not pumping, he fights fires. And you know, if you looked at the contributing factors of improper search techniques, failure to stay in contact with your partner, failure to use the emergency, firefighter emergency guidelines, your portable radio, blah, 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 and the cause of death was listed as asphyxiation, not in my world. That's actually a contributing factor. And in, in my world, he worked for a lazy ass company officer in an organization that didn't care because the organizations that to Mike, to me, that seem to have their act together, ones that, you know what, we're, we're in a very serious business. There are no do overs in our business. And there's a lot of the stuff that the paperwork, the recording, all the things that you need to have. And I'm just talking about one small aspect of what we're going to talk about. But I was absolutely amazed again that somebody could work on a career department and go that long without somebody coming in and going, hold on a second. Look, I got to ask you about this one guy here. Is it, is it, am I reading this right? He hasn't put an air pack on his back in a training, you know, in a, in a scenario in 11 years. And, and so when I, when I look at what the Texas Commission on Fire Protection does, um, 
you know, we, we were joking about, you know, some of the governing entities out there, the, some of the chiefs, they, they refer to as like the IRS or the fire service, because you, you don't want to be, <laughs> sitting there, you're like, oh, we're getting audited. But there's got to be a regulatory, there's got to be an agency out there that's making sure I'm not saying that people are dishonest and making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing because we have an obligation to people out there. We said we're going to protect. So your thoughts on, you know, and we'll get to what the commission does, but your, your thoughts as the agency chief, if somebody, if somebody asks you, so Mike, why, why is it such a big deal for the commission to go out and inspect turnout gear, training records, and I know, I know like I said, we're talking to smidgen folks of what they do, but I want to start with this because this is huge that making yeah. sure everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. When you look at that, what, what do you, what do you tell someone you say, this is why we do this stuff? You know, firefighters and, and I'm singing to the choir here, but, but firefighters are just known for, and their personalities are to get it done. And, and the way I view the commission, and I was a victim of the commission for 30 years. I, I told you that a while ago when we talked. And as a, as a firefighter, as a company officer, even as a training chief, I didn't always necessarily like what, what I was having to do to be compliant, but it was the right thing to do. And, and so we got it done. So when you're dealing with firefighters, I think we're blessed here in Texas to have a group that, that one, is going to hold those random city government type people who don't give a darn about the firefighter and, and don't want to spend any money on the fire service. We're there to make sure they do, but we're also there to make sure the firefighters realize that this is still a dangerous job and we get it. We encourage you to go be a firefighter. We want you to go out there and put the fire out. Let's, let's get inside and put it out. Any one of us will do that. I got a garage full of burned up helmets. Now I can't demonstrate them at the office because you know, it's not clean. But look, that's what I did. That's where I came from. And in Texas, we're lucky enough to have an organization that's going to keep everybody in check, if you will. In other words, it, you know, it, it, it's all about uh, uh, integrity, doing the right thing all the time. I think that's what we're here for. We're here to make sure everybody from the from the line firefighter all the way up to the city manager and the mayor does the right thing every time when it comes to fire protection uh, for the firefighter and for the citizen. I mean, you, you think about that. Uh, the citizens are the ones that are going to win or lose based on the performance of the fire department. And, well, it, it, and you, go ahead. Go ahead, buddy. I'm sorry. Well, as you just said, the, uh, the company officer, at least in, in my opinion, and I had a fire chief tell me this 25 years ago when I was sitting for the captain's test, the captains, the company officers are the backbone of the fire department. And, and if they don't want to train, if they don't want to teach their folks and, and, maintain a, a level of integrity and to hold people accountable, you got a fire department that's out of control. We're not there to, to come in and bust your balls over something you're doing. We're there to make sure everybody is doing what they're supposed to do and, and that they're doing it right and that everybody's safe. And that's it. I, I'll tell guys all day long, man, I'll bury up in there with you. Let's go. But we're going to be smart about it. And right. you better be well-trained and you better be educated. And you better be able to tell when it's time to get out. And, and have the courage to say, it's time to get out. <laughs> you know? Well, and it, it goes back to, you know, one of our good friends and Terry and I, um, uh, you know, retired assistant police chief, Jerry Goller from Louisville, did like 40 something years. Great, great man. Um, I remember, you know, him coming on a Sunday, Mike, they had a, a, a mom with a couple of kids that pulled out before 120 was a toll road, pulled out okay. and failed to yield and got broadside, boom, killed, killed the family. And he came in that uh, he did three roll calls in a row. He came in, he met with all the patrol officers and he said, I'm just here to tell you this. The next time you're issuing a ticket and somebody's yelling at you and screaming at you and spitting on the ground and saying things about you and your family, I want you to think about if one of us had been in the right spot at the right time to enforce that law, that family would still be together. He goes, this isn't just about being the bad guy and writing speeding tickets. This is about keeping people alive. And, and, and that's how I always looked at what the commission and, and, and sadly, you know, this. there are some states where there, it's just, I'm, I go there and I'm like, oh my God, I, I, it makes the hair stand up when you see what goes on um, and what the lack of oversight that they have, you know, that small part, it's a big part, but when we talk about everything you guys do, what the commission does is huge when it comes to keeping firefighters alive. You know, there's a lot of people out there that use that word, the words brother and sister a lot. 
They have the hats and the tattoos and the t-shirts and they're great and all that stuff. But when it comes to doing what you said, when it comes to doing what's right, ah, well, you know, they're here just kicking us or whatever and so on and so forth. You know, are there, are there people out there in the world that have an ax to grind and they get into a position and that's what they want to do? That They're everywhere. There's, there's, there's school teachers, there's plumbers, there's electricians like that. But I, I personally in Texas got to witness what your organization did, your, your group. And, you know, I was like, well, so this has been going on for a while, right? This is how it should be done. I mean, you, you know, I mean, who, who is making sure there's gotta be someone making sure that we're following the rules and we're doing our thing. Just like law enforcement is out there. I was a cop, all that stuff. Long time ago, Terry's still a peace officer. Their job is to make sure, you know, that I always talk about the rules and regulations that the speed limit signs. The reason when I was interim chief in trophy club, the reason the speed limit sign from the firehouse is like 30 miles an hour. Cause if it said 70 people roll their cars into trees. The reason the commission does what they do is, is, and me being a funeral chief. So we do less of those. That, that's their whole goal. I'll, I'll be very selfish here. I, I'll, I'll say, I'll even simplify more. The Texas commission on fire protection, their whole goal is to keep firefighters alive. There you go. You want to, you want to sum it up. Their whole goal is to keep firefighters alive. And if they do that, the ultimate, the end run about taking care of the, 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 the civilians out there is a, is a bunt. That's an easy thing. But so selfishly, I can say that our commission keeps firefighters alive. That you want to talk about the real people that say, yeah, it's my job to make sure they go into their families. That's what the Texas Commission on Fire Protection does. And, and, and then you look at all the other stuff that, that, that you guys do. It's incredible. Real quick, Terry, welcome, buddy. Hey, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, you're good. Are you, are you, are you right. further educated? Are you good? Yeah, I got a certificate and everything. I'm gonna, I'm gonna email that to you, Chief Wisco. I, you I just saw some some CE pop up on the screen for Terry McGrath. So I have to make sure it's not pencil with. Yeah, yeah. I, I said you no, were I, eating I, lunch. No, 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 no. I appreciate you coming on. That's just like me, though. I invite somebody to a party. I don't even show up. So, uh, <laughs> well, Terry, Terry, I just asked Mike to kind of explain, you know, his <clears throat> thoughts on, you know. Uh, you know, when people are, when people are looking at the commission, uh, you know, as the enforcers and things like that and so on and so forth, you know, when they, when they talk about that, how he describes it, and you heard what I had to say at the end uh, about, and he was, he was awesome about talking about just doing what's right. Um, uh, Mike, you know, one of the next things, I guess, and I, I know this is going to be hard with as much, like I, I'll tell our viewers, go to their website, tcfp.texas.gov because you, you, we're going to miss a bunch of stuff in this hour. Sure. So, Mike, if you give us kind of a uh, an overview of what the commission does, because I know I get people all over the country. I'm always trying to recruit people to Texas. I'm going to come to Texas, a great state, great fire service. Um, and they're like, well, how do, I, how do I make that transition? There's very few states, I'll say it, that do what your organization you. does, the commission in an effort to help people migrate to Texas to the fire, to, for a firefighter to come from our state that actually help people do that instead of you got to come here and start all over that there, there's a whole system, but can you kind of walk us through an overview of kind of a lot of what the commission does, you know, well, sure, priorities sure. and, and so I'll, I'll start. You said we had an hour. So I'll start with where it started, which was in 1969, the legislature enacted a, a, a bill for our, uh, Texas Government Code 419, that they gave the authority to a state agency, in this case, the Commission on Fire Protection, to regulate the career firefighters and, and fire departments. And, and that's evolved over 54 years now. But uh, uh, in a nutshell, we, we oversee uh, and ensure the, the education and training and the safety compliance uh, uh, for the firefighters, the career firefighters in Texas. And I emphasize career firefighters are firefighters. However, in, in the state of Texas, the volunteer fire service uh, is not regulated. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. The Commission on Fire Protection is not out to, to regulate all of them. The, the law says we regulate the career departments, and that's what we focus on. Um, what we're seeing uh, more and more today, and we can talk about it in a minute, but uh, more and more volunteer organizations or ESDs are having to become career departments. And, and so this year alone, 2022, we've added 65 career departments to, to who we regulate. So we're over a thousand now that we regulate, but there's 65 
brand new fire departments as far as the state of Texas is concerned. And, and our goal is just to work with them. We want to be, we want to be the Texas Fire Service's partner in achieving and maintaining compliance. Uh, we're, we're not here. We don't, we don't show up in Louisville and say, ah, we, we got you. You're screwing around on a, on a <laughs> webinar instead of doing some training. You know, we got you. Uh, we're, we're not doing that. I'm not going to tell you that's not how it used to be. I think there were a lot of reasons why things were the way that they were. Uh, but for the last couple of years, we're, we're trying to be that, that partner. And we want to help. Uh, so we do, we do compliance. We do uh, training. And that includes curriculum. Uh, we're, we're an IFSAC accredited uh, agency uh, in the world. So um, everything we do here is accredited through IFSAC. Uh, what that means in a nutshell, basically, we're going to follow NFPA and, and the standards that are in place by NFPA. The legislature has put several of these NFPA standards in the law. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it, it, it demands that, that we uphold it here. So our, our job is to find the way to enforce that and keep everybody there. And then the last part is just certification. And, uh, and, and we're going to make sure everybody is... Uh, checks all the boxes and has what they need to, to maintain their certification and they can achieve higher levels of certification. So, so you, you know, Rick, that, you know, you have basic firefighter, but you also have intermediate and advanced and master and, and there's training requirements, there's college education that goes with that. But we've got a total of 46 different certifications and, at, at all levels that, that you can hold in Texas. I mean, from firefighter to fire inspector to airport, uh, rescue firefighter to marine firefighter, uh, inspector, investigator, uh, uh, head of department. We were talking about head of department a while ago. Uh, public uh, fire education specialist, hazmat techs. We, we've, we've tried to cover it all. Right now, we're working on developing uh, certifications that will now be mandatory, but they'll be available for uh, technical rescue and also a, uh, a fire marshal certification. So in other words, almost like a head of department but geared for a fire marshal. So if, if you check these three or four boxes over here, you could be a, a certified fire marshal in the state of Texas. And shockingly, or, or, or maybe not so much, how many other states are, are calling us and they're waiting to see what we're doing with that because they want to follow suit. And I think we're lucky as a Texas firefighter, lifelong, and we talked about that already. It's great to have somebody that set the bar and make sure that we, that we achieve it. And uh, uh, the best part about the commission and all that we do, it's driven by the fire service. Um, yeah, there's 13 commissioners. There's 27 staff members at the commission, but there's three or four committees. There's several ad hoc committees that the commissioners put together. And these are made up from the Texas fire service. These are, these are folks that are doing the job. We let them come in. Here's what the law says. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. You tell us the best way to do that. They, they recommend to the commissioners, the commissioners make it a law or a rule. Me and my staff, we go out and enforce it. And uh, you just, you don't see that in a lot of states. You, you've been to a couple other states yourself and, and we don't have that out there. Um, I think we're, I think we're blessed to have it, but we need to keep it going and we don't need to screw it up. That's why I say we need to be the partner. We don't need to be the, the IRS, as you said earlier, but <laughs> we need to come in and, and, and see what you're doing. Make sure it aligns with what's required, and if it's not, we ought to be able to help you get where you need to be. And, and so, uh, that's where so we're. So, chief, that's where we're trying I, to go. I I jump in here, and one of the reasons I I I thought it would be a a, a good topic or a good uh, platform for Chief Wisco to come on because I've heard him talk or address various organizations. <clears throat> um, his message is always consistent, and and I have I I, I told him one day I said. Um, I'm not, I'm not shy about being critical when, when I don't like something. Uh, and, and when he came in, I heard his first spiel and that may have been to Texas fire chiefs or whatever, but you know, he uses words like collaborate, he uses words like teamwork and, and I love, and I'm going to ask him here in a minute to kind of share that little brief, uh, his, his talking points to his employees of what he expected out of them as far as how they dealt with their customers. Uh, and this is not an adversarial, uh, an adversarial process, but, um, you know, his message early on was 
We are here to help you. We're here to make Texas better. We're here to help every firefighter be better, uh, those sort of things. So he went down kind of a, a path to say, these are the expectations I have of my people. You know, they'll, they'll answer your, they'll answer their phone. They will return messages. They, you know, and, and, and so chief Wisco, if you, if, if you don't mind, cause I've heard you say it uh, several times, but what I appreciate is that, and I, and I heard you use the word earlier as a victim, we were a victim of the, of, of the commission at one point in time. And, and so when, when we were talking, uh, I think it was last month, I have, I was relaying him like an experience of like going into the driver's mm-hmm. license office. There's nothing worse on the planet then going into a DPS office and, and just try to get an address changed on your driver's license. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you leave there ashamed of yourself because you feel like you did something wrong. Um, but, but anyway, and, and in that conversations, when chief Wisco said, nah, it, it's, this was simple for me. I'm going to pull my people in and here's what I told them. And, and, and just as far as their approach and how you handle your customers. Well, and, and it, it's easy and, and you guys all know him, but, but I grew up, uh, my dad had a great friendship with uh, with Chief Brennan, and so I, I grew up in that environment. I, I was around him a, a lot, and I, w- I was fortunate for that. But his his key phrase was "be nice." All right, when I got to be the fire chief in Galveston, I put "be nice" on the side of all the fire trucks, um, and it was a message to the firefighters. It turned out to be a message to the community, but it was a message to the firefighters: "be nice." We're here to help these people. So when I got to the commission. I had some bumper stickers that said, be nice, gals and fire department. I handed them out to all the staff and I said, I just want you to be nice. They have to, they have to be our customer. They don't have a choice. The state law says they have to work with the commission on fire protection. We should be nice to them and let's help them figure out whatever it is that's, that's not right and help them get there. And, you know, really quick, when I got there, there was a survey being done and the, and the survey was coming back in and it, and it was saying things like, your communication sucks. You never answer the phone. Nobody will return an email. I, the, the website's horrible. I can't find anything on there. And I cringed a while ago when Rick told everybody, go look at the website. I'm like, God, they're going to find something wrong with it. And they will. I mean, we're, we're not perfect. But we need to be helpful. Nobody has a choice whether they work with us or not. All right? That, that's the beauty of government. But we could be a, a good experience. We, we I don't want to be the driver's license office and I don't want to hammer on another state agency, but that's not who I want to be in charge of. I want to be known for being helpful. And and so I think in less than two years, the the staff really it's for their credit. I I threw a couple of things on the table and they ran with it. We're we're nice. We we hear it all the time, you know, so-and-so and and they answered the phone. They helped me. They they went out of their way to be, to be nice to me and make sure I got what I needed. The, The website is getting better. Um, I, I did set one rule. It's not writing because, you know, every good chief has at least one unwritten rule. Mine is you're going to return a phone call or an email within 24 hours. Uh, hands down. Now, you got to be reasonable. Uh, How's weekends, that working? Weekends are out. <laughs> yeah, weekends and holidays, you know, you got to give them a break. But let me tell you, since COVID started, which, which was six weeks after I got here, COVID started, we sent everybody to work from home. And nobody was more nervous about that than me. My wife made me get another job when I retired because she didn't want me at home. And I showed up with a computer and said, guess what? I work from home now. So, you know, cats out of the bag. But we're working from home. And I said, man, how's this going to work? How are we going to do here? I think it's phenomenal. The staff picked up. They, they're answering emails at, at 11 o'clock at night, 5 o'clock in the morning. They're returning phone calls during business hours. But, but they're more responsive. They're working on Saturday and Sunday. And, and really quick, I had to I had to tell them all, just because Mike sends you an email at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning doesn't mean you're obligated to answer it. All you need to understand is I'm an idiot. All right? I don't have a life. So if I get bored, I go sit in my office and I'm doing something. Answer me when it's time to be at work. But understand my mind. This is why I don't sleep, because I'm always thinking of something and I'll jump up and, and come in here and write it down or get on the computer and send somebody an email. Let me tell you, the, the staff, they picked up on that. They run with it. And, and it's to their credit that the fire commission today, and again, not, no ill feelings toward anybody before me or any of the staff, they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. But, but the folks today have really picked up on the customer service, if you will. Uh, we, we've got a tough job. We're trying to make firefighters follow rules, which is that, that's not possible because we like to challenge all the rules. And I get that. But let's make it a better experience for them. And, and, and cooperate and, and we'll get a, we'll get compliance 
It's about people reaching their retirement mm-hmm. and being healthy and, and being able to enjoy the retirement. Uh, like we said before, there's so much more to the end run than that. You mentioned my surrogate godfather, Chief Alan Brutacini, and I'm a huge, you know, the whole be nice. It was just, you know, simple things. Well, you mentioned it, you mentioned something before about, you know, the change and Terry talked about the change of leadership. And I've been to so many fire departments as a consultant to help them <clears throat> dig themselves out of a icky hole and get them back to where they should be. And there's so many places out there that were just horrible that are incredible now. And, and, and the whole reason was it's like a football team. Football team starts losing. You can't find the team. You fire the coach. And, and what Bruno used to say, Bruno used to say for the longest time, you can't shit up. Okay. You can't shit up. You can't shit up. You can try, but you can't do it. So it all starts at the top. It all starts with who's running the show. When you come in and go, okay, you know, I know let, I don't want to even talk about the past anymore. Let's talk about where we're going from here. And this, cause I, I, I am, my experience was, I, I I'll, be, I'll be very blunt. I, I used to hate call the because I, I used to get scolded. I I mean I'd get on the phone. I remember getting chewed out because I asked some questions about my certification, and I've got a guy say, "You are not entitled. You are not allowed to to operate at a structure fire in this state. You don't have the experience. You have the certification." I'm like, "No, I do have the certification." Well, it's not here. I go, "But I, yeah, it was I took you know and and then a short time later, I call back and I'm like, "This is not the same organization because." You know, now I'm on the phone with someone who took care of everything for me. You know, you know what I'm saying? It was, it yeah. was, and I'm just saying, just like those fire departments out there that sucked for a while, that are doing great things now or whatever, it's all about leadership. It's all about who comes in, like you said, and go, guys, look. And I think some of your people wanted to do that. You know, I think a lot of people want to do the, there's a lot of rough, tough people that go, enough with the be nice thing. Well, you know what? Tell me how you would want your family treated, and there's your answer. Okay, so stop that. But that whole point is a lot of these employees. A lot of I used to say, Terry, we talk about let, let the firefighters play firefighter, and I don't mean that in the drug. Just let them let them do their jobs, let them enjoy their careers. There's a lot of people, the silent heroes, your staff, the staff that we Terry and I had that make it all happen. They want to enjoy. Come, nobody gets in their car and goes, God, I can't wait to get to work to be miserable today. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and when you get there and you have a boss that makes it that way, or you have other people carrying the axes that they're grinding off in the corner, and then you come in and it's like, you know, you've heard that overused phrase, which is still good, a breath of fresh air. It just takes one person to say, okay, let's push a reset button. And this is where we're going. And like I said, I brag about your organization. I would not do that if I didn't believe in your organization because I don't do that. I'm not a bullshitter. I don't do, I don't, if I can brag on something I don't believe in and I'll support, but I'm very proud of what our commission does here. You know, I tell you, I had my early frustrations with a past administration, but that's long gone. That's water in the Gulf of Mexico. You know what I'm saying? But so one of the things that, that Terry keyed in on, um, and I wanted you to talk about Mike for our viewers I've never seen it in my career. You've been doing this a long ass time too. I've never, it used to be getting a career firefighter job was like winning the lottery. You know, yeah. you'd go Saturday and take like three exams. I mean, it was like, I remember being on like 25 lists and all this stuff. And now we have fire departments offering signing bonuses. You, we'll pay you $10,000 if you come out or we'll pay you $2,000. We'll do it. And it's like, and, and I've been putting them out there like the city of Sacramento they post their their I have it. Their post is 4896 shift, 150 years of tradition, aggressive fire department, all this stuff. And then um Irving just did one, uh 24, 48 hour shift. Every, every, every day's a Friday. That's on their post for their job. I've never seen it before. It's like you want to be part of something special, come to work here. Well, that being said, so many people. I, I know this when I was when I was interim in trophy club, trying to get people hired and then trying to get a fire chief. You know, one of the first places I went to when it came to the recruitment part, when my city manager says, okay, get, we, we need to move on this, was the commission because of the services and the ability to reach so many people with job postings. So I guess, you know, and Terry, this goes to one of the points you brought up. We talked about having Mike. Let's talk about what the commission does to help firefighters process into the state of texas that want to come here it's a great fire service there i tell people all the time 
this is where you want to be. There's some great states out there. Don't get me wrong, guys. But this is I'm, obviously I'm going to brag about this place. But what is it? What, what does the commission offer there? And then what services do you offer support wise to the fire chiefs that are going, I can't hire. I can't. I'm competing with Lewis floor with the ski. How do I, you know, so what do you help? What do you guys do recruitment wise, assistance wise, getting people in and getting them where they got to go? That whole big picture. Well, so two questions really. So the, the recruiting side or getting folks to work, uh, I'm going to be honest with you and tell you, we're, we're looking at that too. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me. We've got 38,000 plus certified firefighters out there. We're getting 300 people a year or better coming to Texas. Uh, I mean, and they're kind of, I told you earlier, they're coming from California, Illinois, New Jersey. They're, they're coming from everywhere to, to come to Texas. Man, that's great. It's a great place. The fire service is the greatest job in the world. I can't figure out why departments are having trouble hiring. And, and you know, I've finally accepted that maybe I'm getting old uh, because I, I caught myself about a month ago. I said, well, it's a dinner, different generation. Well, you know, and I can still see those captains and those old head guys the day I walked in Galveston. Oh, you're just a different generation. You guys don't get it. And here I am now thinking like that 35 <laughs> years later. But, but we got to figure out what what attracts them. I, I don't think I don't think the drive for them is what it was for us. They're not after the longevity. They're not after the pension. OK, um, they're after the shiny object. I'm not going to get into why that is or why I think that is. but. Maybe that sign and bonus is a shiny object, but the detriment of that is that Louisville offers a, a, a sign and bonus. In Galveston or Austin or somebody does it, the guy in Louisville says, hell, I can score some more money. I'm out of here. There's no loyalty to the organization where they got their start. Some of that, you can, you can get your firefighter certification online now. Whereas when we all did it, you went to the fire academy right there into the department that hired you or, or somewhere close to it. And there were guys from that from teaching you. And, and so you built the camaraderie and you built some loyalty. And you started on that overused word brotherhood right there. And, and we felt obligated. I mean, I did 30 years in Galveston. It's home. I love it. I still love those guys. I talk, I talk to some of them every, every week. I miss it. I miss the clowns and I miss going to fires. I don't miss the circuits. But all that to say that we're still trying to figure out what the problem is so that we can help. And, and, and we, we offer our website and our Facebook page for recruiting. I, every time I see one on Facebook, I share it so we get it out there and, and we try to make sure everybody sees it. Um, as far as how we help us get here and get certified, uh, I mentioned it a while ago, we're IFSAC accredited. So that gives us a, a great tool there for about 38 states and seven different countries. But we have to look at what you bring. We have to make sure it lines up with, with what our requirements are. And most of our requirements come from the state law. But and Mike, Mike, let me interrupt for one second, though. Yeah. I want to ask you this question, because you just brought up something that I see all the time. I see people say, well, he's a, he's a, he's a certified firefighter, or, or he's got his certificate. And I'm like, yeah, but where did, where did he or she get it from? Because, and I'm not knocking any particular state or agency, but a firefighter, too, from Bone Gap is not the same as a firefighter two from East Mud Flap as it is from Beeperville and Bopperville. Going back to why the commission is there, you see this firsthand. You just said it. That's why I had to jump in here. It was, sure. you know, they're not all the same. There's got to be someone out there going, all right, Rick, let me look at your fire. Uh, you know what? You're you're missing it. We we require this and you're missing a portion of that. And don't sure. argue with us. Go back to your old place and tell them they they took the easy way out or they missed something or whatever. Cause a certificate as much as the NPA and I love them, you would think a firefighter certified in California be the same firefighter certified in Texas and Illinois, Florida, New York. And you see that firsthand. It is not anywhere close. So you have to have that system of checks and balances to make sure. Right. Right. Because we know what the standard is in Texas. So it wouldn't be fair to, to a, a cadet in Texas or any firefighter in Texas, I had to jump through seven hoops to, to get a job. But I can come, somebody can come in from another state and they just walk right in because they got a piece of paper. And we're not going to let that happen. And, and IFSAC has helped with that. Uh, our standards have helped with that. But but to your point in a nutshell, I mean, there there is a state, and I'm not going to say which one, but there is a state out there where 
they do the same thing we do. You got to have firefighter one and two, hazmat awareness and ops. You have to hold those certifications. They get their firefighter three of the four. And they get them firefighter one, awareness and hazmat ops. And then firefighter two is a task book that they work on at the company level for four years. That requires that company officer and that individual and that organization's training chief to document that. But then we get these individuals to, to they want to come to Texas now from, from this other state. They got three of the four and they can't document or demonstrate documentation to prove that they have firefighter two. I know damn good and well they got it. I know where they came from. I mean, you can get on the internet and watch them fighting fires in, in, in some of these cities in this particular state. I, I, I know they know the job, but we don't have the piece of paper. Oh, it needs a piece of paper. So it's just what you said. We tell them, hey, don't be mad at us. All right. We're trying to maintain a standard here. Go back, ask them to give you the documentation of that. You, you need this paperwork. We even try to spell out, here's what you need on the website. You know, how do you become a firefighter in Texas? We, we've outlined what it takes to be able to do that. This is what you need to bring us so that we can help you. And the faster that we can review it and approve you, the better. So the, give us the, the documentation we need. You know, we'll get guys, they'll give us a book this thick. There's one page in there that, that we can use. Or you got other people who don't give us crap and we got to beg them. It's like pulling teeth to get them to go get this. But that one state that, that just leaves it to the company officer and the individual to accomplish that task book for firefighter two, that blows me away. And <laughs> And, well, but the, those are the fire there. chiefs. We work with them and we get them there. Cause, cause those are the fire chiefs. Doing. Yeah, those are the fire chiefs that say, no, it's okay to not wear your turnout gear every time you get off the rig. It's okay to not bring your tools with you. It's okay to, you know, we're, we're you know, we've talked leadership on this show all the time. And again, it goes back to who's running the show there. And there's got to there's got to be someone that just says, you know what, like, it, it, you know, this is how we have to do things because if we want to talk about doing what's right, then you have to live it. You can't, it's like being honest. You can't be half honest. You can't be half pregnant. You either are, you are not, you know, you, you can't just talk, you know, this, you have to be that person that's out there. You can't, you can't pretend there's enough fakers out there. There's enough posers and there's enough agencies that do that. It's like, I, I, I can't tell you in my career. And I'm sure with you, Mike, as long as you've been doing Terry, you and I've talked about how many people have said, yeah, that's what they want. But all right, tell you what, this is how you get around that. Well, some of that getting around is just not right. I mean, you know, here is the process. Just go through it. Be done with it. You know, put your effort. But the whole the 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 kind of back door that goes on, or the brother in law, as they call it, that kind of stuff, is not. It's dangerous in our job. And and I'm not trying to uh, be like overly dramatic, but yeah, go ahead. No, it, it is. But but I. I... To be honest and transparent, I know we got a lot of people from other states outside of Texas watching this. Hopefully, we're not perfect. We we got leaders right here in Texas telling you it's okay to go inside a burning building without your protective clothes on. We we got leaders here in Texas pencil whipping training. I mean, we we're not perfect, but our our job, our role here is to is to try to to flush that out and and fix it. Uh, you know, uh, I I tell people all the time the commission's been here since '69. Three departments, three departments in 54 years have been monetarily fined for not getting it right. All right. That tells me there's a shit ton that we're doing something wrong and we helped them. We helped them find a way to make it right. And, and they got it. I think everybody, 97% of the people in Texas, they want to do it right. They got reasons why they're cutting corners or cutting edges. And, and we're just here to, to call them out on that and help them figure out a way around it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it, you got to do it. And, and we've got a standard in Texas. We're going to live up to it. We got people right here in Texas that want us to lower the bar on certain things all the time. And, and I won't get into what or who or whatever, but we're constantly fighting amongst ourselves. So we're far from perfect. Uh, don't come to Texas because we're perfect. Come to Texas because the weather's always different. I mean, it, <laughs> so right now where I'm at, it'll change in 15 minutes. I promise. So, <laughs> well, yeah. and one of the things, Mike, I want to throw out there too is, so we talked about the IFSAC certification and pro board and being able to take some of your stuff and go, okay, we, you, cause you guys are all dialed in. You all the, you all you, you and your fellow wizards from all the different States, when you guys get together, you know, I know at FDIC, there was always a time where they, you know, all the state people would get together and talk about what do you guys do in Texas? What are you doing here? And sharing and talking and all that different stuff. Like you said before, borrowing things and that when I was in Illinois, we used to have all kinds of States go, 
can you send it? Curtis Burt is the ops chief at Pearland. He was the chief in Lake Cities for a long time. Good friend of Terry and I. He's been with me forever. Curtis wrote the technical rescue program for the state of Illinois. All the certifications. He wrote that, designed it. He's incredible with that stuff. And, 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 and you know, we were intimately involved with that stuff and being part of it because people listen. But what I want to get at is, and I'm living proof because, you know, when, when, when we started putting the gold stickers on mm -hmm. certifications, there was a point where they said, well, all these certifications, you have all meet the criteria. You could grandfather clause in, you know, it's going to cost you so much per certification and we'll switch them all over. And I have one because I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm never leaving Illinois. I'm not doing that and all that stuff. I'm not going to do it. So I come to Texas, you know, to be a fire chief and like any other state, a lot of states have different requirements. And I said, what do I have to do? And I, I just want to say this for our viewers. If you don't have that gold sticker on any of your certifications, the commission will still work with you. They worked with me. They sat down and reviewed all my stuff. My, right, we talked about something. They reviewed everything I've done and said, all right, Rick, you're good to sit for this exam to get me to my department head certification. So there is a mechanism. There is a system that works with everybody, not just those. You may have been in a state, if you're watching this, like Mike said, and Terry and I have talked about it before the show plenty of times, that kind of doesn't do a whole lot for their firefighters. You know, if you're there, don't feel bad and don't say, well, I can't come there. That's why I always tell people, like, go to your website, go to that section, click on it. They will help you come here if you want to come here. You, you I know, had a guy, uh, ahead, I had a guy, chief, that mm -hmm. called about a month ago, and because uh, we had just we just tested, so our our application period was open. So he called. Do you hire someone from out of state? Yes, sir, we do. What's the process? And I said, well, you have to have both your certifications, EMS and fire, prior to the anticipated start date. Okay, so I've got National Registry EMT, and I that's squared away. And I said, all right, have you looked at the, the Texas Commission? No, I haven't looked there. So what, what's that process like? And I said, well, you, it's on the website. It, <laughs> it couldn't be simpler. It's on the website. So he said, well, you know, I, I, I couldn't find anything on there. And I'm like, all right, well, let's walk through this together then, because I'm going to pull it up. So, you know, within about three clicks, I get this guy. And I mean, it's literally, it, it couldn't be more um clear uh and 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 to to, to get that process started and, and i also want to throw kudos to to chief wisco because during my last conversation with him there was probably four or five of us sitting at a um I don't know, it was a library or a coffee house or you know something maybe <laughs> maybe uh, oh, yeah, oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. could have been a you know a lobby of a children's hospital we're getting ready to volunteer or something but uh the uh he brought it up and he and basically what he asked was what, what can we do to help you we've got guys coming in from out of state i've got you know it and so he's throwing out ideas and really i kind of sat over there and thought well crap he's thought about this much more than i have and i'm i'm working for an agency that we're struggling you know finding people so you know i the the fact that his team is down there thinking about this i throw that out to the texas fire chiefs and and anybody that still uh, you know, views this relationship as contentious in any way. Uh, but I, I mean, it, it's, it's very proactive. There was a question chief, I think that just flew up on chat. Somebody was asking about yeah. age, age requirements age in Texas wrong, and, yeah. and uh, you have to be old enough, but you, but you, uh, you, you, we don't care how old you are uh, as long as you're old enough. And, uh, and, and you get it at 18 or you're eligible to get it at 18. Um we we have and and you know those I guess Chief Wisco, do you guys have a bead on how many programs the high school programs that are because uh, we've got numerous in our area. The the interesting thing right now is that we're actually hiring. Uh, you know we're we're probably into the second wave of many of those programs that have started where they walked out of high school with uh, their uh, Texas firefighter uh, certification. End to EMT certification, 18 years old, you can sign up, get a job potentially for $70,000, $80,000 a year. Uh, and and uh, I, I can't think of a better uh, a program. And I'm assuming there had to been some interaction or collaboration or some assistance lent by the by the Texas Commission mm -hmm. to make all that happen. Well, there, there has. And, and I was just, uh, I was at a, quarterly training with our compliance guys last week and we were talking about that there there are at least 
12 brand new high school programs right now that, that we're interacting with or that we're aware of and we're trying to help them through this. Um, they have identified some challenges. You've got the TEA, the Texas Education Agency here in, in Texas, and our folks, our compliance guys identified some, some misinformation on their website um, that was basically saying, man, you, you guys can go teach the basic fire academy, but it didn't say anything about having to reach out to us and be a certified training facility. So we, we got with TEA, we got that fixed. We're working with these schools. Obviously, you know, I said it earlier, I'm with the government, I'm here to help. So when we walked in, they got mad, but we said, hold on, hold on. There's, there's a way to do this. We're gonna help you do this. But to answer your question, Terry, I'm gonna tell you there's probably between two and three dozen of these high school programs up and running right now. I expect that number to double in the next couple of years because I, I think that's where we're at. And, and we're seeing it. We're seeing more and more high schools come to us to get certified as training facilities now because they know they have to do that. And uh, I, I think it's gonna be a big deal for us. I, I, and I can't say enough about our clients guys. They get their butts kicked every day because they're doing so much and, and there's only seven of them. Um, but the high school, the high school programs are, are just one more avenue. And uh, the good thing, uh, for most accounts is that they're Texas firefighters that are teaching them. So, so they, they should have a, a general knowledge of, of what we're looking for. And, and that's made it easy in most cases to, to go in and help them be successful. And, uh, and I love, I, I love those I programs. Yeah. Mike, I love yeah. those programs. I, I, anytime I'm, I, I'm asked to visit with that, a class, or sometimes they'll bring them to a pride notion class. I love that. You know, we talk about the recruitment and retention challenges that fire chiefs face. Here, here's a great opportunity to help recruit people to, you know, for the fire service in, in your state or because there's a lot of other states too, too, but that I've seen that here and I love it. I think it's a great, it's a great way to, to get someone to fold into this career, you know, right from the get go. And, and that answers one of this, where are all the applicants at? Well, how about we be creative and how we get them out there, um, you know, and do it. So the, I think that's, you know, the, the question about, about uh, Terry, uh, the age thing was another guy hit me. I, I made a note for a couple of questions. I got <clears throat> hashtag FE talk. All right. And we can hit us. We'll get them, but I still get them sent to me. And I, I, I copied a couple down. So 18 years old to start. All right. I know when I was there for you, Terry, we didn't really care. Now, what, what is, what is the limit for hiring? And Mike, what, you know, we'll jump to you in the state of Texas that answer that question, start and finish age, if somebody want to come here? Well, so I'll, I'll say this, it, it, it's a local issue. So we, we say you, you need to go through the certification program and get certified with us. And, and on the medical side, locally, you, they may want an EMT or paramedic. So what we say is you have to have at least 40 hours of medical training. We don't care what that is. Uh, if, if, the local department of Terry and the guys in Louisville, they want you to be a paramedic. That's between you and them, but we're going to certify you as a firefighter. If you've got some medical training and you can document it and you're certified as a firefighter, we don't really put the age restriction on there. I, I think it pretty hands down uh, 18. I mean, cause nobody's going to hire anybody before 18 to, to do this job. Uh, unfortunately I, I'd have 40 years in if they would have hired me when I was 16, but you know, anyway, <laughs> uh, our, our requirements are strictly to the education and the certification side of it. And we don't get down in the weeds at the local level. Um, and on there's, that. Some, there's some applicants or some people that come in, Terry, you and I've seen it <clears throat> that are not 21 years old. They're much older than that. And they do incredible. They're in great shape, yeah. physical shape, mentally they do their, you know, so I love that. And I love the fact you said that it's a local issue because we've talked on this show with plenty of people and chief Halton's a big believer in, government kind of the big government needs to stay out of the local business that's how we end up screwing things up and i love that you said that and earlier we talked about like we were mentioning lateral moves a buddy of mine jay coon was the captain of sacramento city california uh union president a long time builds houses on the side teaches economics at the college brilliant smart man all right friend you know family was friend with with, with president reagan and all that and he did a paper, Mike, on lateral transfers and how it was hurt in the fire service. And this is a union president. This I have a union that it's all about getting his guys more money. He goes, I'm not about against that. He goes, what we're doing is we're chasing a dollar. You mentioned this earlier. He says, guys are going, well, I'm here five years, but look at 
you know, sand whatever is hired and they're get so I'll go there and I'll make this much more money. And then I'm there for so oh oh look and then I go here or I can transfer as a as a captain to here, you know, because now that I have it here, but I'm gonna get more money and there's more. And you didn't see the longevity. Now I had I also had a a I, I work for a lot of headhunters helping them find fire chiefs, right? And I used to say this a long time ago, and one of them straightened me out. I'm like, yeah, this guy's a good guy, no one, but look at how many departments he's been with. He was the chief, you know, here, 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 here. He goes, yeah. And I go, dude, he, he doesn't have, he goes, have you, he goes, Rick, have you ever been in the business world? I go, what? He goes, in the business world, a lot of times that's how you get ahead. You work so long here, you get to a point where nothing's on the horizon because of, of whatever, and you get offered, you move here and you move here. He goes, why is that such a bad thing in the fire service? He goes, tell me why someone has to be with the same agency for 30 years rather than two agencies, you know, for 15, 15. And I really, there, I, there was a couple feeble kind of, you know, I'll call that that I came up with. And I really couldn't argue. I said, okay. He goes, no. And, and I went back to, I go, cause this guy's a great guy, be a great chief, but he's been so many places. He goes, and he goes, was he fired? That's what he said. He goes, did he go backwards? You know, it, it, obviously when you're looking to hire someone, let's make sure they're still climbing or they're doing this, not because they got, you know, dumped or whatever. And I, and I realized a long time ago that as much as I had, I hated the chase and the dollar thing, you know, it hurts us. But when you get higher up in an organization, most good fire chiefs last five to seven years, you know, and then after that, they got to be really dialed in and tuned in. And then, you know, so, you know, is it such a bad thing to move from one fire department to the other? I, you know, and I, I'm kind of sitting there looking at, well, maybe for a firefighter, but not just a chief, but how can I say that? But maybe it's different when you're looking at an administrator versus, you know, I don't know. I just, but it was interesting. He wrote that paper and he goes, look at this. This is, you know, guys are, you know, they're not into the job anymore. Like we talked about, they, this was more of a, our, my buddy John says, I well, they look and go, okay, I could go work for streets Monday through Friday, be out there doing this. I could go work at, at, at this factory. I go work here. Hey, this fire department job, I, I work 24 hours and I'm off a couple of days and I get to do that. You know, it, and, you know, so we're getting some of that, not as much. You're what a third generation firefighter, right? Yeah. We're not getting that as much as we used to. So I, you know, I don't know. I, I looked at it going, you know, that, that was kind of an answer to one of the questions I got for somebody is, is it good or bad lateral transfers? And I'm like, well, I used to say, I didn't like it, but I don't know. You know, I, I don't know, but I can see where it hurts because there's no longevity and nobody has the ownership within that department, maybe because I'm big into that. Yeah. But how do I say it's okay for, I don't, I don't know. I'm, you know, and I know I just threw that out there in about 10 different directions, but you know, different generation, you know, that's what... <laughs> well, first of all, you said 24, 48, and that's yesterday. We don't yeah. do 20, 24, 48. Are you kidding me? It's one day on eight days off. We... Hey, yeah. chief Wisco, I was going to ask you because, uh, I, I think you're, I, I guess what I'm curious, and, and I take cancer out because I, I feel like we, uh, I feel like that is a current topic, has been a topic, and will continue to be a topic. We're, we're dealing with staffing, and so we, we kind of understand our challenges there. What's, a, what's something else that's on the horizon for that, that we're going to see coming down, um, you know, through legislation, through the, because I, I, I as far as I, I, you're way more dialed into this, uh, you know, this type of stuff than, than I am at, uh, and based on what I'm doing, and that's probably an ex uh, a bad excuse to say that, but, but uh, what, what's something that, 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 that's going to be a hot topic that, that you think? You know, I, I think uh, clearly, at least here in Texas, and I, I think around the United States, um, the, the next big thing that we're all going to have to drill down and focus on is, is interacting with law enforcement at these high profile mass injury and fatality events, uh, school shootings, whatever you want to call it. And we all know what's going on here in Texas, but you know, law enforcement and I love them. I'll, I'll share a donut with them any day. And some of my best friends are cops, but they'll tell you, they'll be the first ones to tell you they suck at incident management. They always look to the fire department to do it. I think what 
what we have to do, what I'm trying to figure out right now in my role, is how, how do I forge a better relationship with, with the state law enforcement guys and, and even the EMS folks to let's, let's work together. Let's truly work together on this incident management. Not because I want the firemen to be in charge, but guys, we've been doing this 35 years, 40 years now. We're, we're pretty good at it. Even if we don't want to admit it, we're pretty good at it. And, and we can come in and help them. I mean, uh, the, the law enforcement mentality, go get the bad guy and eliminate him. Man, I'm all about it. We, we go get the fire. Let's put the fire out, the problem solves, you know, and if you get it out before the chief gets there, it's even easier. So <laughs> I get that mentality, but somebody's got to, to manage that chaos. And, and I think all of us, and I think again, at the local level, I see a lot of cities, they're, they're already working on this, but at a state level, I think that's what's right here in front of us. And the legislative session is about to start. I read a hundred and something bills today that had the word fire in them. And I, cause I'm trying to get my head around that. But um, I think that's right now. I think that's where we're at right now. We've got to knock down these barriers between uh, our brothers in blue and, and start working together to be part of the solution there. And uh, I don't know what the answer is. I, I don't want to say we're better at it than they are. We do it. We focus on it. Uh, I, I think we can partner with them and, and help them get better at it. We, we can teach them. Um, but, but and I think, it. Mike, I think, Mike, we started 21 years ago, you know, 9-11 hit, and we started down that path of bringing everybody together, you know, and I think people thought the NIMS training was going to do that, and then people found ways to get around all, you know, and I think it just kind of weaned again to where we kind of, we start off coming together, and then all of a sudden we kind of shot off and did our own things. And I said this, I, you know, there's that book written, that's written out there called The Tipping Point. The Tipping Point, like how UPS stayed, Terry, I think you even told me about it, right? You referred about, you know, how UPS has stayed in business all the years, you know, from a hand delivering to buggies to horse and wagon to the whole thing to airplanes. And the tipping point I said when it came to active shooter training in this country was, you know, Parkland. It was like all of a sudden, our, and I'm very partial. All three of us are very partial to law enforcement, our law enforcement family. My wife works for it, Terry. You were a Dallas cop. Um, you know, it, it, you know, finally someone said, you know, I think we need to involve fire and EMS in this whole active shooter training thing. So after that, you saw agencies training together for that, which got that better. But we're still lacking on the incident management side of things. Like you said about, we'll go, I, I've seen it at large wildland situations up here you know, in North Texas, where I'm like, they're, they're down there doing their thing. You have to stop them driving on the street and go, who, who's in charge on the PD side or whatever, instead of all these things we started trying to do 21 years ago. I think it's a great point. Yeah, no, and, and I, I just, I think that's where we're at today. I mean, the other big things, we, we, we got to get our hands around the, the mental health aspect. We got to get our hands around the, the injury and, and the, the benefits for, for those that get injured and can't do this anymore. And I, I know that it's home with you, Terry. And, and uh, I mean, we've sat through a lot of those conversations, but it, I think those things are important and, and we got to, we got to figure all that out. But I think right now, right in front of us is the, the, the mass injury events. And, and we got to get better at that. You know, I'll tell you, we, we talked about Tommy Anderson earlier and, and unfortunately in 2018, they had a, a school shooting at the high school. Uh, I was the chief in Galveston. Tommy called me, my assistant chief was Tommy's deputy chief at the volunteer department. He said, I need you to get your ass up here now. Well, the reality for me in that was my son was a junior in that high school. And I didn't know where he was. I didn't know what was going on with him. And, and so like any stupid dad would do while we're driving a little higher than the speed limit to get up there to help Tommy, is, is, is I shot him a text. I said, man, just say something. You know, let me know you're all right. Well, I'm home sleeping. I said, shit, you're good. Stay there. Just, <laughs> just but, but when we got there, funny law enforcement, they were there to get the bad guy. The bad guy had been detained. But, but the first three people I saw was the sheriff's department representative, the school district police chief, and Tommy. Well, the school district police chief and I started out as EMS explorers in, in Galveston back in the <laughs> early 80s. All right. He went on to be a cop. I went to be a fireman. The, the, the sheriff's department rep that was there, the, the ranking one, he was a volunteer in Santa Fe for 25 years. His brother's a fireman. So the three of us looked at one another and said, 
we got this. They're, they're not going to like us, but we can fix this right now. You know, let's get some order to this. And and they did a great job. We let those two law enforcement guys leave. They knew what needed to be done. We were just there to help them. But it, we got to work together. And we got to knock down this. Well, this is the cop. This is a cop deal. You guys wait outside. Man, if we wait outside long enough, you're all going to be dead. And <laughs> you know, let, us, let us help you manage that. And, and I think there's a way to do it. I don't know what the answer is other than we all need to start talking. Well, at this, at the local this, level, it's this particular platform, Mike, and, and, and you know, Tommy showed me the picture. These guys showed me the picture for that school shooting. I think it was like three miles long of police law enforcement vehicles outside that school. But I say this, Terry says this all the time. We love the fact that we work for a group, you know, this fire engineering, the group, which is FDIC, Firefighter Nation, Fire Apparatus Journal, Jebs, and a, a, a whole bunch more. Um, with a boss, Chief Bobby Halton, who not only embraces mental health awareness, but insists that everybody around him does. And, and our platform has always been, you know, with, with Bobby and with our group, it's that we're finally at a point where we tell people it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to need to talk to someone. You're not weak, you're not a coward. And then besides the mental health aspect, let's talk about the other things that are, that I think people end up traveling down that path because now this fire service job that they love, you know, very few, God bless them. There's a ton of hardworking people out there. There's very few factory workers that drive by the factory after they retire going, God, what's it 110 degrees, Terry? I wish I'd go back and work that press all day. But they drive by a firehouse and they go, God, I wish I'd go to have a cup of coffee. And my buddy John says all the time, just like you said, I'm like, I don't miss the circus. I miss the clowns. Well, now you take someone, and Terry, we've talked this in Louisville specifically, young firefighter who's into the job, loves it, and now all of a sudden they can't do it. That is like, that's like cutting off like an arm in their life. You know, I'm just saying it. And we don't even consider those kind of injuries and how to keep people where they should be and so on and so forth. So that, again, another great point you made. It, it, mental health awareness, huge. We're on that. But there's another aspect when it comes to when it comes to injuries wise that we need to be aware of when it comes to firefighters. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. Well, and, and you know we hadn't gone there, and I know we're running out of time, but but Texas is notorious for uh, making 1851 a state law, and 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 with the agency I'm at, we, we get beat up every day for that, and and I get it, it's expensive, but what's the goal? The the end result here, the goal is to to protect the firefighters so they can get inside and, and save the people that need to be saved or save the pets. You know, that, that, that's what we're here to do. And, and we hear all the time, you know, oh, don't be a sissy, you know, quit crying, get your ass back to work, get on the truck, let's go. You're gonna make another bad call. Yeah, 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 you're right. But you also hear people say, oh, you gotta stand in the flower bed and spray water from outside. I don't think anybody's saying that. So, sometimes that's the best option. And I think you got to be smart enough to know what that is. But the clean gear, I can tell you in Texas, the, the, the 1851 has had an impact and we're seeing it. We do this injury report every year and it's benign information we get from all the departments. They tell us about their injuries and we put together this jam up or I don't, I got some staff members that do a hell of a job with it. But in the last three years, it's consistently showed me one thing, fire ground injuries, incident scene injuries are at 9%. All right, so we had 6,400 and something injuries in Texas in 21. 9% occurred at an incident scene. 38% occurred in the fire station. Come on, man. When I came to work here, it was dangerous to go to a fire, and you're pretty safe in the firehouse. Well, that's flipped. So back to the very first thing you said, Rick, the company officer. They're the backbone of the organization. And, and I'm all about having a good time at work. I, 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 had, I had three things I told recruits when we brought them into Galveston. I want you to be. I want you to give me 100%. I want you to be proud to say you work here. And, and I want you to have fun. But there's a limit to the fun. We, we got to stay within the law. We, we don't want people to get hurt. But, man, if you can't have a good time at work, especially in this job, you're doing something wrong. So, But the numbers, the numbers in Texas in 10 years are showing us that having cleaner gear, we're, we're doing a better job. We're having better maintained gear. And there's all kinds of arguments to that, and, and I could argue both sides of it too, but but I think we're making a difference. I'm not saying everybody needs to make 1851 a, a state law. That, that might be extreme. I think we're lucky here, and, and we've made it work. Guys like Terry and Louisville and, and Galveston and other departments, they figured out a way to make it work. But well, the, at the Terry, end of the day, 
it, it, it's to keep the guys safe, the firefighters safe, so they can do their job. I want them to get inside. Let's let's go, man. You burn up your gear, get some more, clean it up, and get, and get back to work. Nobody's saying don't put out the fire, but we need to embrace that. And sadly, sadly, and you see it every day on Facebook and everywhere else. You see guys out there just screw all that safety stuff. Let's go get it. Well, man, those are the guys we're here for. Those are the guys that, that you, you're here to to help guide them the right way. And uh, well, and we, Mike, we started doing Terry. You remember when we years before that standard. We were issued two sets of gear to everybody. Actually, we did it every for the longest time. Every three years, you got a new new 50, NFPA 1500 ensemble, and you kept your second set as long as it met. We were giving away gear, right? Helping us come and pick up gear with only that was that was like going into it. It was six years old. I mean, that we, you know, yeah. so we were doing that. And I'll tell you real quick, we talk about this as a show. Fort Worth has always been cutting edge. Fort Worth's a great organization, great fire chief. And, and but I don't know if you've seen what they're doing with gear one there, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cr- they show up at, at a at worky fire and all right, energy, energy two from a time one report to, and you report, you go inside because not everybody is, is Metro Dade. Not, you know, two thirds of this country has a winter and you can't stay outside when it's 10 degrees and get out and you're wearing sweaty shorts and a t-shirt and socks in the middle of the street and have nothing, you know, we're all about the clean cabin cancer wear. So I'm, you know, I always said we're about two great ideas away from figuring out, well, Fort Worth came up with a great idea. And you, you know, even if you had a car fire and you figure you got your stuff exposed, gear one pulls up this old, you know, bomb unit. They pull up, it looks like a single axle heavy rescue. Change out, you walk in, change out your gear. You know, you decon your helmet, your boots, but you get your gloves, your hood, your stuff. And when you come back your next shift day, there it all is, your other sets all clean, ready to go. Working fire. I, so there, there, if you want to get it done, there's a way to get it done, you know. Oh, yeah. um, you know, and there's and, a lot of departments that have found a lot of different ways to do it. And, and, and our compliance goes out and they, they tell everybody, hey, if you're struggling with this, here's an example. Uh, here's an extreme example. Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, Houston. But but I mean, they're, they're small departments. They don't have the same resources, but they're getting it done. And and we're firefighters. We're, we're going to figure out the problem. Well, and I we might not like the way we do it, but we're going to figure it out. We're going to make it work. <laughs> and I said that, Mike, I said, so how does a, a, a one or three station department that doesn't have the money to buy everybody's second set of gear. When they have to take their stuff out, of, they're out of the whole fire department's out of service. You know, or a whole shift is, for that matter. You know, I, I mean, so the, we've got to be better at working with everybody and trying to figure out. You know, there's there's all these grants out there for all kinds of like, you know, I, I love the drones. I'm glad about all this stuff, but we still have people that don't have portable radios, which astounds me. And we still have people that don't have good turnout gear. And I'll say this, you and I, I know we're on the same pages. I know Terry is because we've been partners a long time. You know, if you're fire chief, if your guys are wearing crappy gear, all right, your fire chief should have bald tires on his or her fire chief's car instead of fancy commitment. Your, your people come first, you know, and, and you better be taking care of your people if you're the boss. You said it. I've said it for years. The company officer sets the tempo for the shift, man. That's the person. They're they're the ones with the strings. Firefighters are the hardest working people in the fire service. They'll do everything you tell them to do. You know, they're just screaming for leadership. You know, so I mean, so okay, let's. I know we got to wrap things up here. This is one of the other questions. I figured that I drew a circle on this one because somebody asked me this from you, Chief. Okay, um, we'll close with this one. What your recommendation is as as you've been a boss a long time, but as the agency chief with the Texas Commission on Fire Protection, what would be your recommendation to firefighters and to fire chiefs? Um, and this question was to to and it, it, he kind of ended up with three things. It was the hiring thing we talked about, recruit whatever. What what advice would you just give a firefighter and a chief today? You you've got all these years in the fire service, you're sitting atop of a great team. You know, you're big into teamwork that that's making a huge difference, not just in the state of Texas, nationally. OK, what advice do you give to the new firefighter, the company officer, to the chiefs that are out there from your seat? You're sitting with them, having coffee. You know, what would you what advice would you give? Them? Well, two things. One, don't ever stop learning. And it doesn't matter what seat you're in, whether you're the chief or you're a brand new guy. If, if you're the brand new guy in the fire department or girl. And you know, someday you want to be a chief. It starts day one. It set the example. So it, it seems kind of uh, uh, Madonna-ish, but but what do you want your legacy to be? 
And that's how you need to start living and working every single day when you walk in the door, all the way up to the chief and company officer, battalion chief, deputy chief, whatever. What do you want to be remembered for? You, you want to be the guy that, you know, never wore his PPE to a fire, but damn it, you're going to have your, your shirt tucked in when you're walking around the fire station. Or when you go on a call at three in the morning, you're going to have your class A on because you got to look good, you know? Or do you want to be remembered as the guy that, that did the job that everybody else is doing now, won't ask anybody to do something he wouldn't do himself, and never stop learning and teaching? And, and that's the only way we're going to get better. I, I still go to class. I went to class last week. You know, we just, we just made it a requirement in Texas that everybody do some cancer awareness training. Work with our partners at the Firefighter Cancer Support Network and, and IAFF, and it's a it's a stay rule now. And and you got two years to get it done. Every commission employee who's certified still, and there's 11 of us, sat in a class last week. The local department gave us their training facility for the day, and we went and did the cancer awareness class. And I said, guys, we're going to do this first. If we're going to go tell everybody else they have to do it and they have to demonstrate to us they've done it, we're going to be able to show we've already done it. You can't ever stop learning. And it, I go to conferences. You know, Terry mentioned we were all at, at the hospital trying to be volunteers the other day. We were in town. We were in town for a conference. You never stop learning. Yeah, I might show up and they give me 20 minutes to spout a bunch of crap because I represent the state of Texas. But I'm going to stay because there's something there that day that I'm going to learn. And, uh, and, and and you can't ever you can't stop that. And, and you got to lead people by example. And if you want them to learn and get better, you got to continue. Well, and the great bosses like yourself, Terry, how many times have you brought it up here and other people that have been sitting at a at a, a conference anywhere, whether it's Teeks or anywhere across the country, and they look and they see my buddy John Salka sitting in the front row, just got done teaching, he's sitting in the front row taking notes in someone else's class, or Bill Gustin, or whatever. I think the great ones that are out there, Mike, exactly, the great ones never stop learning. So with Bobby Halt, we're driving four and a half hours, five hours from Tulsa, to, to over to Rogers, Arkansas to do a program. And I'm sitting in the passenger seat, Bobby's driving and Bruno's behind me. This is 48 years with Phoenix, 26 years as fire chief. Oh, oh my God, years teaching and training after that. Mike, the whole way there, he's tapping at his shoulder. Rick, Rick, read this article. Rick, watch this video. I looked at Bobby about the three hours in his trip. I go, does he ever take a nap? Does the guy ever, here's a guy that has earned the right to go, and, and he's reading and learning. And I'm like, and, and our circle of friends that all of us here hang with are those people. I mean, I love hanging with the people who are into the job and not just, you know, what's shiny, but, you know, everything, all, all things fire service. That's what we talked about this show. So, all right. So if they want to get a hold of you, is it best, Mike, uh, to email or just go shoot to the website to contact you? What's the best? Oh, way here, I'll, I'll give you my email right here and, and you'll get an answer with, within a reasonable amount of time, hopefully 24 hours, but uh, it's, it's Mike, M-I-K-E dot Wisco, W-I-S-K-O at T-C-F-P dot Texas spelled out dot gov. Very and, good. Uh, I, I wish I'd have sent you that sooner. But look, I appreciate this opportunity uh, uh, to, just to be here with with you and Terry, and and in the presence of the others that are watching, it is a is a, an honor. And I appreciate all the nice things you said about the commission. We, we really are here to help. There's great people there. I'm just the janitor. I, I get to clean it up, and for some reason they want me to be the face. But but uh, we we all love what we do. We're here to help you, and, and don't ever hesitate to reach out. And and you guys ever get bored or want somebody to make fun of, man, I'll be happy to come back. <laughs> well, and don't forget the uh, the custodian, I think, was at the Air Force Academy that all those students looked at for the longest time. <laughs> they found out he was what? A Medal of Honor recipient. <laughs> and uh, there's some pretty yeah. special people doing all kinds of work. So tcfp.texas.gov. Um, I am, I'll just say this to any of our viewers. I'm, I'll be, I'm honest, I'm, I'm, I'm living proof. I went from, a very strong not liking of the commission when I first got here too. I think they're pretty incredible. And I, and I mean that with all my heart uh, when it comes to, I wish more States uh, were able to pull off half of what you guys do, Mike, because uh, it's incredible. And, and again, I'll, I'll be very, very blunt here, folks. They're, they're about keeping firefighters alive. That's it. If I'm going to say it, everything they do is about, keeping firefighters alive, whether it's trying to bring the best ones to Texas through their means and they have it, go to their website, they'll help you, whether it's through compliance, whatever. It's about making sure you go home to your families and 
there's a lot of people out there that do a lot of whole lot of talking and don't back it up. And the Texas Commission on Fire Protection backs it up. So there you go. That's my my deal. Mike, thank you so much, buddy. Terry, great idea. Terry's like, I got a great idea for a show. We got to get, and sometimes you, you ever sat there and went, hellfire shit. Why do we not think of this sooner? Well, we should have thought about having you on a long time ago, uh, buddy. And uh, uh, again, you know, uh, doing some great things. So Mike, thank you very much, brother. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate Terry, it. Terry, Terry, Thank you, man. Oh, yeah. Terry, closing thoughts? Uh, no, I appreciate it, uh, Chief Wisco, for joining us. Uh, I was glad that we could do this. And uh, uh, I wish uh, I wish Chief Salka was on here because that's always a uh, – I figured <laughs> the, the Galveston dialect and then that, that New York dialect, there would have been uh, some good back and forth. But, uh, but no, I appreciate it. And, and I, I am sincere when I say that, um, Chief, Chief Lasky, you'll be interested to know our compliance officers, Rick Wallace, who 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 worked for us. Remember, he left and to go teach. And um, so uh, anyway, great relationship. He does a fantastic job when he comes in. Uh, I remember uh, when he retired. I remember walking around Central when he was pacing. That was his last day. We had cake and coffee when he was taking the new job. So. Yeah. So, but, uh, but with all that being said, the, the, I've had, uh, through, through my TIFMAS responsibilities, a lot of interaction with different, uh, different compliance guys or, or representatives from the, from the, uh, fire commission and they're, uh, they're rock solid, great approachable. And I, I know this is tailored to the, the people that are in Texas. If you, if you're a firefighter outside of Texas, uh, my apologies, I don't know who your, your fire commissioner is, but, um, but, uh, this one's taken. So, uh, but anyway, no, I, and, and I, I think there's some good things to come. That's why I was curious to know what, what he sees on his future. And I know that he is as uh, interested and passionate as I am about workers' comp issues and, and some of the injustices that are happening uh, with, with, with injuries and, and those sort of things. So uh, I, I consider him a very valuable, intelligent, valuable and uh, ally and an and a, and a asset for all of us. Well, like I said, uh, COVID is our next challenge. And Terry and I have talked about it that, you know, with the fire chief, when we did our show on COVID, it had Fort Worth come on with what they were doing with the return to work physicals. There are little boys and girls in kindergarten right now that 25 years from now are going to be going, hang on a second. I've got another COVID claim here and we're going to be fighting for people's lungs and their lives later on if we don't get our act together with some things. So Mike, thank you again. Terry, email buddy. Uh, yeah, you can get me at, uh, I'm at the city of Louisville, T McGrath at city of Louisville.com. All right. Well, I'm at chief Lasky at gmail.com and, uh, chief Halton, chief, uh, uh, Salka and chief, uh, Thompson will be with us, uh, our next show, which will be, uh, December 21st. We have the third Wednesday in the hump day hangouts. Uh, all of us that are using this panel, we're all on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and the web and everything else. You get a hold of us. Fire Engineering always has some, some great hangouts here on Wednesdays uh, at noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern with some awesome, awesome folks. Don't forget the podcast every evening with just a cadre of great people. Visit the site, fireengineering.com. After that, go to the Texas Commission on Fire Protection's website at tcfp.texas.gov. You, if you want to come work in this state, go to that website. They're going to walk you through how you need to get here. We want you. We want to steal from everywhere else to come here. If you're good, if you're good and you're passionate, we want you. If you love the job, if you don't. Anyway, that being said, uh, in closing, we always ask you to please keep the men and women in our forces in your thoughts and prayers. And please remember this, never forgetting means just that.